You need to experience these things to believe it. I often say to our people, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Otherwise, you're not doing it right. And you have to go through that emotion, if you like, because the first time you do it, you'll feel like you've blown it. You've pushed my client too far. You're not going to win, etc. And then guess what? You do win. You've got a better deal for both parties. And you start to believe that this is actually a, a smart way to run agency negotiations. My name's Mike Lander, and you're listening to Higgle, the B2B sales club podcast where we bring you actionable insights about sales RFPs, negotiations, and difficult procurement discussions from sales leaders, brand leaders, and procurement leaders. Please subscribe to get updates when new episodes are released. John, thanks ever so much for joining me on the, the B2B Sales Club podcast. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, John, um, let's kind of kick off with, first of all, kind of basically who you are. So, kind of who you are, what you do, what your role is, and what your background is. Of course. So, uh, well, I've been at Ogilvy for uh, a number of years in a variety of different roles. Uh, I've been the CFO for a couple of our UK businesses. I've worked in regional roles. Um, I led uh, commercial strategy and operations for our EMEA region. I've worked in New York. More recently, I was the CFO and COO of our UK business. Uh, that was probably up until about September last year. Uh, and I'm, I'm now the chief uh, commercial officer for the group uh, globally, which is which is a great role. I mean, it really, without getting into too much to, to detail, we're focused on obviously on our commercial uh, strategy. That's everything from pricing strategies to commercial models to how we partner with some of our largest clients, how we position ourselves in uh, a new business situation, particularly obviously in terms of uh, the, co- the commercial side of that equation, and then very much about the behaviours that we want to see across our own organisation and how we train and develop uh, our teams to, uh, you know, to continue to raise the bar in in that regard. So it's a it's a great role in in that respect. So I guess that's that's the work side. Uh, you asked uh, about uh, me. I guess um, what can I tell you that you wouldn't necessarily suspect? I'm a cyclist. I'm not built like a cyclist. Ah. I've never underestimated riding a bike going up a hill. <laughs> uh, and I've just been studying, actually. I have a fine interest in wine, uh, collecting it as much as uh, the occasional glass. Oh. And so I just, uh, just in my um, we set Level 2, which for those that know that program is is not bad. I, I managed to get the distinction somehow. Well done. Uh, so I'm really keen to go on to do Level 3 and Level 4, which is actually a, a diploma. But I don't think that's compatible with uh, work. So that's probably at some time in the future. But yeah. So two of my passions, cycling and uh, a nice glass of red wine. Oh, really interesting. Well, how, I mean, just out of interest, how did you get into wine as a passion? Do you know what? If I'm, if I'm honest, I think it was at a very, very young age, coming back on family holidays with my father. And we would always stop, though, obviously, in those days, I sound like an old man, but uh, you, you, you could bring uh, wine back into the UK, yeah. um, you know, reasonable quantities. And we would stop somewhere on the way and stock up on on wine and i used to follow my dad around the supermarket looking at labels and he would educate me on uh, kind of what this meant what that meant what he was looking for and i, I guess it's always stuck and obviously that as i've got older and learned to appreciate not just wine but uh, you know the methods and and uh, how that whole industry has developed I, i've just always found it incredibly interesting and you know what it's like if, it, if it's something that you're interested in then it sticks Correct. Uh, so yeah it's um, certainly something i enjoy learning more about which is probably no different to uh, negotiation. Um, if you're interested in it, yeah. <clears throat> then it becomes a bit of a passion, and then you get better Very at true. it because it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. let's kind of get into the first question. So, in the kind of <clears throat> the pre-record call, we talked about uh, one particular topic, which is kind of the psychological and emotional behaviours in negotiations, and how can you spot them, and how do you deal with them? <laughs> So I think it's a great question, actually, because um, I think those of us that negotiate regularly have probably experienced a situation in which emotion has come to the table. And I think it comes in two forms, if we want to be uh, kind of uh, simple about it, either genuine, uh, that could be the pressure on either party, that could be the frustration over perhaps not uh, making the progress, uh, or other factors that we may not, may not be obvious during the exchanges. Or I think it can also be a tactic. It can be a technique. And actually understanding the difference between the two is really important because you do, I would argue you deal with them slightly differently. Um, but I think, it, I mean, certainly I guess when it's extreme, I think calling a timeout is yeah. uh, a wise uh, thing to do. Um, I think 
you can try to bring the conversation back down to, you know, what is the purpose of the negotiation? What is it both parties are trying to get from it? And try to bring it back down to, you know, we often talk about interests yeah, and proposals to exactly. push a conversation forward. So try to bring it back down to that level and take the emotion out of the uh, out of the room. It's not always easy, and that's why sometimes taking a time out uh, is wise. And I would I would urge caution using it as a tactic. I think it, it can be done. I don't like it because I think um, you lose authenticity. Yeah, I think you can very quickly lose a bit of credibility if you're not careful. But I think it's important to understand when the party you're negotiating with may be using it as a tactic. And as I say, then there's. Yeah, that's slightly different to genuine emotion, which clearly needs to be dealt with and and removed from the room. Whereas as a tactic, you might just uh, play it slightly differently. So exactly. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I see emotion in in, in kind of a negotiating um, context. And, and just on that kind of topic around kind of uh, emotion and interests, um, uh, certainly. Um, I've always thought, and, and obviously the books tell you the same thing, which is interests are the kind of the motivations that sit behind someone's demands. Because people say, I say to people, oh, find out what their interests are. And they're like, what do you mean? Do you mean what they do in their kind of like away from work time? I'm like, no. (laughs) What's driving them to make the demands they're making? Is that what you find as well? Yes, but I think you use a really interesting word there in terms of demands, because demands and interests aren't necessarily the same thing. Correct. And if we're not careful in a negotiation and we, and we just hear uh, the demands, you're not necessarily getting beneath that to understand, okay, what, 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 are the, what really are the interests? What are we genuinely trying to solve here? Correct. And it's only through getting to that question or at least the answer to that question that I think you can really move not just the negotiation forward, but in that direction where you start to um, find resolutions that work for both parties. If you focus on demands, the chances are it's going to be a little bit more win lose in terms of the yeah. style of an approach, and that and that clearly isn't is isn't a great way to take or handle a negotiation. So I think we really have to be careful. Demands, particularly if you're dealing with procurement, procurement will have a certain style and they'll make certain demands. But to your point, behind that there will be, and sometimes it might be obvious, but often it's not. Okay, what is, as I say, what is the business problem, or what is the what is the um, What is it from this negotiation that the client really wants? And that isn't necessarily the same as what they're demanding. Absolutely. And in fact, I think over my years of experience, probably yours, John, as well, that that becomes one of the key things in creating success in the negotiation and unlocking an awful lot of value and taking the heat out of the moment as well is getting behind what are your real interests? What's going on here? I completely agree. And back to where we started in terms of emotion, it's a nice way of taking that emotion um, out of the room. Yeah. I mean, funny enough, talking about emotion, Mike, I, I'll, I'll share a very brief example with you, but yeah. just just for listeners in terms of where it can be a tactic. So we, we were negotiating with um, a client that we knew very well, one of our larger relationships. We would have typically annual negotiations, but there would be uh, things that say that might come up during the year, which would uh, need resolving and so on. So we knew one another well, both parties, um, uh, a lot of respect. They were tough, but generally fair clients. And this, on this particular occasion, the, it, it wasn't just that it got emotional, it got emotional so quickly. It was hard to understand yeah, yeah. quite what had driven it to that point so soon in the discussions. What's more, what we had, let's say, tabled, uh, to move the negotiation forward, I knew it was really reasonable. So I, I, I was a bit lost as to what was going on. And this, in this particular situation, there were two new clients in the room. When I say new, we, we, we knew the clients, but they weren't typically involved in the negotiation. So anyway, the emotions get high very, very quickly. Next thing, I, I kid you not, papers, books from across the t- side of the table, <laughs> thrown at me and the team. The client, who I know, know very well, stands up and walks out the room, slams the door. So, okay, that's a good time to take the time out. Uh, Sounds so, like uh, it, yes. We yeah, we reconvened. Anyway, the reason I share that is late, later, once we'd um, got past the negotiation, the next time I saw this client, uh, they explained to me that the pressure that they were under to demonstrate, so the other clients in the room were from another part of their network who felt that the global clients managing the agency relationships weren't looking after their interests. 
Uh. And so this was designed. So we, we obviously, you, you could be forgiven for thinking that was a tactic to unsettle the agency, yes. right, to put us on the back foot. Actually, it wasn't at all. They were trying to show the clients in the room that they did have their best interests at heart and they were really pushing the agencies as far as they possibly could. Now, we can debate whether that's the right way to do it, but that was the reason for the emotion that um, escalated very quickly and the reaction. So it had nothing to do with us whatsoever. So it's very easy to, um, as I say, you need to deal with the emotion, but sometimes it's not always what it seems, if that makes sense. And how did you manage to um, understand that? Did, did you understand it in the moment or did you kind of like after the event go, what was going on here? I wonder if that was the dynamic. I, I must be honest, I, in the moment, absolutely not. I, I couldn't, particularly could because I knew the client well and we had a very good working relationship. I yeah. couldn't understand how it, if you like, got out of control so quickly. So no, I didn't. And, and in fairness, although when we reconvened, things were more civil and you know we got to a, a point that uh, I think we're all happy with. No, it was only talking to the client, uh, I, I forget, but sometime after. Yeah. That it, you know, that um, it transpired uh, that that was the case. So, no, it was a very strange situation for me, not not one that has happened too often, which I'm pleased about. Exactly. And not the kind of thing you can read in a book either. That's an experiential thing. No, no. And, and you're right. You, you know, you can, you can have negotiation training, you can read in the book, and they're all great and absolutely valid. But actually, it's only through living and breathing and enough negotiations and experiencing yeah. those types of behaviours that you can remain calm and you can you know, understand how best to deal with it. Exactly. Um, and just to kind of polish off that question, a very good friend of mine years and years ago said the moment that you become emotionally attached to the outcome is the moment you've kind of lost the deal. And I think it, it still rings true in my mind now is that being passionate about what you do <clears throat> is critical, but being emotionally attached is a very bad idea. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. So John, second question. Um, so the importance of negotiation preparation um, and kind of like, you know, uh, sub questions, knowing when you've won and uh, about discounting and how that works in your kind of preparation thinking, et cetera. Okay. Well, I think when we talk about preparation, I would argue, although there are various stages to a negotiation, I would argue that that is the most important for many reasons, not least if you prepare correctly, and that isn't you know, five minutes in the taxi on the way to the client. <laughs> you know, I'll leave Correct. your discussion, you make some notes and see, you know, that's, that's, um, ha that happens probably far too often, but yeah. clearly isn't uh, anything close to ideal. But so preparation is key. But if you think about it, even some of the things we've talked about already, you know, for instance, okay, if the client gets emotional, how might we respond? Yeah. You know, what questions are we going to ask to really understand their interests? We think we know what they want, but we might not be wrong. You know, what's our, What's how walk, I always say to my team, you must have a walk away point. It sounds very Correct. obvious, but if you don't have a point at which you're prepared to say no, then don't be surprised if you come up with an agreement that you're not going to be happy with. Yep. And, and, and you have to stick to it. You have to mean it. Um, in, like what information are you going to share? Or what information are you going to ask for, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can start to, what, what, what alternatives do we have if we can't reach an agreement? Yeah. You, you have to go through that process. I think uh, firstly to you know, drive a better outcome. But also it gets the team aligned on the approach and how we're going to play it and how we might respond to uh, difficult questions. So for me, preparation um, is absolutely clear, absolutely uh, key. Sorry. Completely agree. And I think absolutely. sometimes also, yeah, sometimes also, Mike, I think we have to put ourselves in our client's shoes. The, that's not, that doesn't mean we give the client everything they're asking for. But I think only when we understand the position they're in, that you know that they have their business challenges just like we do. But if we if we start to think how they might think or better understand the chat, the pressure they're under, I think it gives it's really good context for how you manage not just the negotiation, but the, the the tone of that negotiation and so on and so forth. And you can be better prepared for emotions if they if they come to play. Yeah, I, I mean, again, if you don't mind, I'll, sh I'll share an example with no, you. No, please so, do. Many years ago, we were pitching, I say many years ago, not that long ago, but we were pitching for a piece of business that um, we, we desperately wanted to win. The CEO at the time I knew was absolutely desperate to land this particular piece of business. And so if we weren't careful, I could see what would happen. We would get into that negotiating yeah. <laughs> uh, room and we'd end up giving everything away. So um, the night before the first meeting with uh, procurement and we this was a big piece of business we knew this was going to be you know even on a good day a, a number of rounds and so on and so forth 
I kind of scripted how I thought the meeting would go, mm. you know, how, what, how, how, how the client would open the meeting. You know, you're 20% too expensive. You're one yeah. of three agencies <laughs> left, but if you can't meet our target, you Sounds won't make familiar. it to the next round. Yeah, heard that the, before. The, yeah. the, the, the formula, yes. And uh, so, anyway, I scripted the uh, uh, meeting as I thought it would go, agreed we would meet for coffee beforehand and just chat it through. And you won't be surprised to hear that, give or take, the meeting largely followed uh, yeah. that kind of pattern. And we did that for, I'm going to say, three or four uh, rounds. I, yeah, I did the same thing, same approach. This is what I think uh, they'll open with. This is the kind of pressure they will put on us. Here's how I think we should respond type thing. And I think it was after, I don't know, say, say meeting three, meeting four, or negotiation three or four. And we're walking out of the client's building. And my CEO just had this enormous uh, smile on her face. And I said, why are you smiling? Well, we just had a really, really tough negotiation. And she said, I get it. I, I, I get it. I get, she called it the game. I get right. the game. And now there were, there were further rounds, but then you had, she was still desperate to win it. We still wanted to land it as a business, but you had a real ally in the room, right? Yes. You weren't trying to negotiate with your own people as much as you were the clients. And, and that was a great, uh, to your earlier point about you need to experience these things to believe it. I often say to our people, you have to be, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Otherwise, That's right. you're not doing it right. And you have to go through that. Um, emotion, if you like that, that because the first time you do it, you'll feel like you've blown it. You've pushed procurement too far. You've, or it might, might not be procurement, the client too far. You're not going to win, etc. And then guess what? You do win. You got a better deal for both parties, and you start to believe that yeah. this is actually a, a sensible, smart way to run agency negotiations. Exactly. And once you've lived through that experience, like the individual I mentioned uh, earlier has, then they're a convert, and they're and then. Pretty much any negotiation that follows, you might need a little reminder occasionally. Yeah. You've got, as I say, somebody in the room that is prepared to, um, you know, support the strategy, which again is back part of the preparation, right? Being sure we're all aligned on exactly what we're going to do. And actually, if we think about that in the context of new business, um, if we, I mean, you tell me if you disagree, but knowing you, I suspect uh, you, you won't. But if you're <laughs> negotiating with uh, procurement in detail, uh, let's say as part of a pitch process, yeah. then I would argue there are only two reasons why that negotiating is happening. Uh, most likely, you've already won, and procurement have been charged with getting the best possible price from the agency that uh, they want to appoint for their business. Or it's possible you may have lost, but somehow there's, um, I don't know, there's, there's leverage that the client can have by negotiating with you to put pressure on another agency. Either way, why would you, you we, we'll get on to discounting in a minute, yeah, yeah. why would you reduce your price? Because you've already won or you've already lost. So, and I think if you go into that negotiation with that mindset, then that is very, very different to how agencies typically approach those negotiations, where you assume you can have to meet procurement's demands and give X, Y, and Z. Now, don't get me wrong, there is a, there is a negotiation, there's a dance to be done with your clients, typically in our world it's procurement. But that you, you mentioned discounting, but a negotiation is a trade. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's like trading um, uh, uh, items. So if you're just reducing your price and you come back to the agency and say, well, that was a tough negotiation, it wasn't a negotiation at all. You just, just, you just given uh, it away, you've discounted. So I, I do think, I wish more agencies would think in that way when they get into those com those difficult conversations with clients. And I say that because it sounds like I've said procurement a few times. I don't blame procurement at all for their approach. I mean, why wouldn't you keep asking if people keep saying yes? Yep. So, and I, and I think agencies have to recognize the role that we have played. I don't say now demise, that's too strong, but in the pricing that is now seen in the marketplace, because for too long, we've just been saying yes and giving things away, discounting to your point. Exactly. Uh, to to yeah. oversimplify. So agencies now need to steer our, our, our way out of this. Uh, mess, if you like, and only by bringing value back to the table, by you know having a proper negotiation strategy and sticking to uh, the plan, w will we get there? And um, I don't know if I'm answering your discounting point, but the, no, you are discounting is, my goodness, is just um, well, we're just going to drive the price in the market <laughs> even lower. And correct, uh, guess it's what? It's a torched earth. To yeah. Yeah. Who wants yeah. to? Who very, wants to own a torched to earth? Point Pointless. Yeah. And I think yeah. if there's one thing, actually, John, from this, uh, just this episode, there's always like, you know, one or two things people should pick up. Um, as a, as a basic principle, if you just change the word from discounting to trading, an agency's 
just yeah. did that, things would get an awful lot better. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think also beware, I, it depends on what kind of training you've done. It, it, everybody calls it something different, moment of truth, slicing yeah. the salami, but whatever it may be. But d- don't snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. You get to that <laughs> final conversation with the client, yeah. you, you're there. Then, again, quite rightly, the client's going to ask if you can do this, this, and this, because we keep saying yes as agencies. You have to you know, stop or, or at least trade. Have, you know, by all means, have a list of things that yeah. you're prepared to concede. Understand what that, the value of that concession is to the client and ensure you're securing something in return. It's really simple. But in the heat of the moment, we seem to lose our way. And as you say, we're, 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 we're very close to towards earth as it is. Exactly. And you know, <clears throat> just negotiating against yourself is just a bad idea. I mean, <clears throat> we haven't talked about it, John, and we don't need to, but I've, I've heard of people recently, agencies saying they've been asked to enter a reverse auction for their rate card. And I'm like, a reverse auction? We used to buy nails using reverse auctions. Yeah. You don't buy creative services using a reverse auction. I mean, it's crazy. It's, a, it's, a, it's an unbelievably insane idea, I yeah. believe. Oh. I mean, absolutely. They're, they're less prevalent now than they were. We still see them a bit in our health business. And, and don't get me wrong, we, we have had one recently, which I'm surprised about. But to your point, a crazy... You, you, you think about it, we work in, in an economy of ideas and innovation, yeah. right? And so it, if, you're, if you're coming into this industry now or you're considering wh- wh- whatever you might do, ideas and innovation, wow, where do I sign? Then you get here, you find agencies are giving all that magic away. Yes. It's scratching your head, what? <laughs> and that, that's effectively what these e auctions or reverse auctions do. So you just have to you have to agree what your walkway point is, right? That's right. Might, it may be you don't use your price at all. I, I again, I like to think about it this way: if you're going into an e auction, clients already decided which agency you want to work with. It, this is just a means, a crude way of trying to get the price down. Correct. There will be small agencies in there, or agencies of less quality that have no intention of working with, but they know will be cheaper. It's purely to put pressure on you as an that's agency. Right. So you have to hold your nerve. And we have been the lowest price and not one. And we have been, well, I say lowest, one of the, we've been equally one of the highest price and still one. The decision is made. It's just a crude way to try and get a better price. So hold, we must hold our nerve. Fortunately, I think, as I say, they're not as prevalent as they once were. But is, to your point, it's a crazy way to buy it is. creative services. Just, just madness. So, John, very conscious of your time. Um, so last question. Um, so yes. um, the importance of investing in training mentoring and feedback for your commercial leaders. Just touch on that for a second. Of course. So, I mean, I think it's vital. I think we never have, uh, and I, I think this is true across the industry, we never have enough um, availability, if you like, of our commercial leaders and thinkers for every client situation, whether it's new business, obviously we try and prioritize new business and existing client relationships. But um, if you think about it, even if you put a great kind of commercial framework in place, Actually, every day your teams are negotiating scopes, prices, yep. and so on and so forth. And you can't be in every one of those conversations. So, um, so training uh, our people, uh, I think, is abs- absolutely key. And I, I, this is the best investment that we can make. Right? It's not. It's not. Um, I certainly wouldn't see it as a cost. I think it's a, a vital investment that we as agencies need to make. As back to your point about torch earth, we're all struggling with this. We all. The collective needs to be, get, be be stronger. And funny enough, Mike, we, we developed, during the pandemic, we developed a, a negotiation skills, pro- actually it's, it's a commercial training program of which negotiation skills is part, sure. but one that we felt we could deliver online. Uh, and so, you, you know, with trying to be more responsible uh, environmentally and so on and so forth, whilst I still think there's a role for face-to-face yep, training, particularly when it comes to negotiation skills, you can record it, you can really give uh, more dynamic feedback. Nonetheless, to, to raise what, let's say, is a relatively low bar, a little bit higher, these online programs can really be very, very effective. Yeah. So we've done that as an example. We've also um, developed a uh, commercial training platform uh, uh. that, again, is, is more, um, you, you know, it's more more of an entry-level program. But yeah. we're trying to, we're trying to think of ways of getting all of our people through commercial training that was you know, cost effective. At some point, you can't, you know, you can't train everybody face to face, given the number of people that we have. So, um, yeah, and and but what's great about this is we actually cannot keep up with the demand now. Uh, people brilliant. realise the importance it is 
to, for them to be successful in their career, but they enjoy it. You know, yeah. their training is very interactive, and we literally cannot keep up with the demand. So it's a rather long-winded answer to your question, but I, I see the training element of our role, bringing the organisation along this commercial journey with us, as absolutely pivotal. And I think also, John, it's uh, you know, rightly uh, you're saying it's about upskilling the industry. You know, the agency yeah. world, if we can train and develop people, because people move on, it's natural, you know, during their careers, then everyone benefits. I remember when I was an apprentice, I left school at 16. And um, one of the things with all the engineering companies in our area, what they all said was, if we all train great apprentices, then we'll all benefit in the long run. But you've got to take a slightly longer term view of the world. Yeah, it- yeah, well, I mean, you, you, you said it perfectly. And I think, it, you know, as I, I've sat on a number of different bodies, I, I sit on one now with the um, EACA and, yeah. you know, agency leaders, we're, it's to your point, it's a shared challenge. We all um, are struggling with the same um, challenges in this regard. And we all, yeah, we all, we all need to hold hands and uh, we do in an appropriate way and, 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 and be stronger. And I think training our uh, people educating our people is is key to that, but also being brave enough to give them. We talked about the importance of the experience. You, yeah. At some point, you need to let somebody have a go at this, and and yeah. you know they won't always get it right, but we learn from our mistakes and in time. But I also think it's funny. I don't, I don't know if you would agree, but you, you you said something at the start of the call which I thought was interesting around uh, negotiating. If you have a passion for it, mm. uh, you know you, you want to learn more, and you get. But I think that's absolutely right, and I think we can train. Um, everybody, um, you know, as much as we possibly can. But ultimately, some individuals will be better, you know, uh, disposed to negotiating, whether it's being comfortable in those difficult situations. Because naturally, there's it's a point of conflict, right? It's, that's right. That's why, why why we're negotiating. So not everybody will be able to be, you know, your 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 A team negotiator. That's okay. Uh, but but there are plenty that will be, and those that aren't, then you ensure they've got the support in the room. They, they'll be brilliant at other things. So I think it was really interesting you said that at the corner. And again, I, I, I agree. It's a real challenge for us. No, I, I think that's absolutely right, John. Um, I think um, everyone should have the foundation skills, but we shouldn't force people to lead complex negotiations if, they're, yeah. if, they're, if their own personal disposition doesn't lend itself. But yeah. they will contribute to the negotiation in a different role, maybe. Um, so no, I, I yeah, definitely agree. I think it's a really important point. So John, it's been fantastic. Thank you ever so much for preparing, which you have done clearly, uh, and for joining in the conversation. Um, where can people find out more about you? Um, well, LinkedIn would be, I, I guess, the go-to, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm not so much on Twitter these days. No. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, and obviously, if if there's interest in, uh, in ogilvy.com, then uh, obviously there's plenty on the website in that regard. Uh, we are also talking, Mike, just so you know, with some of the industry bodies about some of the platforms that we've uh, developed because, to your point, I feel um, if the if the industry at large raises its gain, then we all stand to benefit. So it, it might be that we can release some of the things we've developed to uh, a wider audience if that's useful as well. That'd be amazing. John, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks ever so much for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for listening to Higgle the B2B Sales Club podcast series with your host, Mike Lander. Please subscribe so that you'll catch all the next episodes.